and from ancient times people had been crossing the Atlantic. The Vikings from the north uh, came across and they landed in Canada. There were also reports of Phoenician uh, sailors, Nubians, other people who crossed the Atlantic. In terms of the Muslims, there are some very interesting writings that were written in books and I, I came across some of these things myself. And in 956, approximately, um, one of the great uh, Muslim historians, geographers, Al Mas'udi, he wrote a book called Muruj al-Dahab wa Ma'adan al-Jawhar. And in this book, Muruj al-Dahab, he actually traveled himself to different parts of the world. He was a traveler. He was like Ibn Battuta. And he wrote down a lot of his writings into this book uh, called Muruj al-Dahab. Now within this book, and I'm quoting the book in my deeper roots, so when you get the deeper roots, you'll actually see the quotes uh, coming in and where to find the, the quotes. Uh, Al-Mas'udi writes about the journey of um, a man by the name of Khashqas ibn Sa'id. And he said somewhere around 889 AD that Khashqas left from Lisbon, which is now present-day Lisbon in Portugal. He left from Lisbon and went into the ocean. And he came back with a ghanima. He had like booty, he had goods with him. And everybody in Al-Andalus knew about this journey. This is Al-Mas'udi's writing. And this is interesting because I actually ran into Muslim scholars who had read these same books, but they never knew what happened to the people. Another report is uh, Abu Bakr ibn Umar al qutiyah And this is in 999 AD the journey of Ibn Farukh, that he also went into the ocean, uh, you know, encountered a, some islands, came back. Al-Idrisi, Sharif al-Idrisi, uh, wrote uh, his book, Kitab al-Mamalik wal-Masalik. So he's writing about the kingdoms and the journeys in the world. And Idrisi was a very famous uh, geographer, Raja I of Sicily, actually invited him to Sicily, and Idrisi made a globe for Raj Raja. This is 11th century, right? So the, we didn't think the earth was flat. They say Columbus, they thought that the earth was flat, and people will fall off the end. But in the 11th century, Idrisi already had made a globe uh, for the, the, the Christian king of Sicily at the time. And um, Idrisi writes about a group he called Magariba. And these sailors, probably from the area of Morocco and North Africa, they went into the Atlantic Ocean and they found a deserted island. And they spent some time and they went to another set of islands and they were captured on these islands and taken to a king. This is Idrisi's writings in Arabic. It's available today. They were taken to the other island and on the island the king spoke to them with a translator who could speak Arabic. And he told them there's a journey of about a month and a half or so, you know, between you and here. But the Shahid here, the witness is, they were speaking Arabic. So there was enough contact going on between them that they learned, because Arabic was the business language of the world. It was one of the trade languages of the world. So they, they were actually doing business with the people from the other side. It was not strange for them, for somebody to come across uh, and land on their islands. What was a deserted island? Allah knows best, but in my own journeys, I found that the island of Bermuda, uh, Bermuda is actually was a deserted island. But if you go down south to the Bahamas chain, uh, then you will see, so it's probably down in the Bahamas that they reached. And um, very interesting uh, journeys. There's other reports uh, by other writers. These are some of the important uh, reports that come. Still people will say, the historians and geographers will say, okay, that's words. We need some hard evidence. Bring us your proof. Now the problem we face is that when the Spanish conquered much of early, uh, in the early times in America, one of their policies was, was to burn every single book they could find. 
They started this in Al-Andalus when they came from the north and then they came down and they took Toledo uh, and then Madrid was a Muslim town, right? Madrid, Toledo, Seville, uh, uh, Cordoba, Granada. Every time they took a town, they would burn hundreds and thousands of books. That was their policy because they did not want the conquered people to have their own culture. You have to learn Spanish. And so the historian will say, give me some hard evidence. This here that you find on your uh, screen is a map. In 1517, Peri Rais, he's a famous Turkish navigator and geographer. He presented a series of maps to the Sultan, the Ottoman Sultan Selim I. This is known in Ottoman history. He, pre he presented him a series of maps of the world. Now what is interesting about this series of maps is that one of the maps in particular, and this is the detailed of the map, this map here is showing the coastline of South America from Dutch Guyana right down Brazil. And you can see the details that are in there. And when they checked it later on in the 20th century, they found the latitude and the longitude of this map is almost exact. That's 1517. If Columbus discovered America in 1492, right? Then that's eight years, and then 17, 25 years later. How can you have a map like this? So this is hard evidence of the presence of Muslims. And this is probably the reason why the Turkish president, uh, Toyeb Erdogan, made the statement publicly, we discovered America long before Columbus. Because he's got the map. It's in the Top Kapi Museum in Istanbul right now. You can look at the map. And they, they trace the map back. It is a well-known, Piri Rais is well-known person in Ottoman history. So how could they have, this is hard evidence of the presence of Muslims, that we had the maps, we had astrolabes, we have the true compass, magnetic compass. Okay, so now this is your evidence now. How is it possible? Because many people will argue, you know, Columbus, you know, how can you say somebody came before Columbus? It's not possible. I'll show you another map. This is a map of Idrisi, uh, of al-Mas'udi. Al and this map here is, uh, is um, the way Muslims did their map. It was the other way around, right? What you call an upside-down map. Because we didn't think north was south, right? We thought south was actually north. We had a different concept altogether, right? It's only now that you think that you're in the north of Canada. But I was living in Cape Town for 10 years in South Africa, down the bottom of the world, right? I wasn't hanging upside down, right? The sun was above me and the earth was below me. So who decided what this is north and that is south? It's all about your perspective, right? How you look at it. And you could have different ways of looking at the map. This map here, this is uh, the actual uh, picture of uh, Al Masoudi's map. I want to turn it around for you. Okay. Now, um, I'm going to have to show you this. Okay. You see here, uh, this would be Africa here. You see the Arabian Peninsula? You see India now? Get the map now. See this Scandinavia? Look at Spain. You see? Here he says, out of Majhula, unknown territory. Okay? That would be the Americas. Because Africa's right here. Remember, this is this is like 956, right? This is a long time ago. This is a long time ago. You see? Here is um there's Arabia there, right? See it? India, there's Indonesia, okay, there's Scandinavia, Spain. Okay, so Africa is here, it's an old map. But he said here, out of Majhula. It's not Australia, right? Australia will be way over here. What is that land there? Unknown territory. So this unknown territory was actually, this is the oldest, probably the oldest depiction of the Americas on a map. That's probably the oldest one. Okay, so these maps, these are some of the maps that we actually have in our things. 
So now, we have astrolabes, compass, we have maps. Let's look at another technology or another power, and that is what is called the equatorial, the currents. These lines that are drawn here, a current is, is a power in the ocean, a magnetic power. It'll carry you through the water. You don't need sails. It's a current. And it literally takes you to, and if you see the currents, you see how it's going on your map. It'll take you out of West Africa, or, or there's one from Spain going right into the West Indies or Caribbean. There's one now between West Africa and uh, uh, South America. It takes you right, because the distance between uh, Africa and South America, see the distance here? That's not a far distance. Here, if you're talking here, that's far, it's a bad ocean. But this one here, it's close. Okay, see it here? Right there. See the current? It takes you right there. These are the equatorial currents. So these currents now, that's another proof that Muslims could have done it. Not impossible to do. Right now, if you're in the island of Barbados, if there's a sandstorm in Mauritania, they feel some of the sand there, based on the, um, what's happening with the clouds and the wind. Sometimes, you know, things, there's wood and things drifting from West Africa into Barbados and the Caribbean. It comes in the currents. So it's possible. What about the boats? The Arab Dao, this is a Romani boat. The Romanis and other uh, Arabian seamen were traveling the oceans before the time of the Prophet ﷺ, they reached Japan. So they had international travel. That's the Arab Dao. A Norwegian scientist named Thor Heyerdahl. Okay, so back now in 1969 or so, he, he did a series of journeys. And he took a boat from Safi in uh, Morocco, and he traveled uh, using the currents. He had the boat made by African people using African materials. And he traveled on the boat himself, and he landed in the West Indies. He landed in Barbados, the area. He took another one called the Contiki, and he went from the Pacific. He crossed the Pacific by himself in a boat. And if you want to see his boats in, in Oslo, Norway, there's a museum especially for Thor Heyerdahl. And you can see the boats of Thor Heyerdahl. Okay? So we have the technology now. We have the boats. Okay? All of these different proofs are there for us coming across. Now, one of the strongest proofs comes from the 14th century text of Al-Umari. And this is Masalik al-Abrafi Mamalik al-Amsar. This is the journey of the enlightened people in the kingdoms of the world, the cities. Okay? In this book, the writer, the reporter for Al-Umari, his name is Amir Hajib, he interviews a great king of West Africa who was known as Mansa Musa. Mansa Musa. And Mansa Musa was the emperor of Mali. In 1324, Mansa Musa made pilgrimage, and we may talk a little bit more about him later, later on, but Mansa Musa made pilgrimage to Mecca, they had fabulous gold. According to um, top magazines in Europe, they were trying to figure out who is the richest person in the history of human humanity. They had like Rothschilds, Carnegie. These are the real rich families, right? Mansa Musa, the gold they had in Mali at that time, they said that he was worth $490 billion in present day standard. He is the single richest person in history, according to this, you know, Western uh, concept. So they had a lot of gold. So Mansa Musa wanted to make pilgrimage to Mecca in 1324. He's got a lot of gold. He makes a caravan, and he puts 15,000 camels laden with gold. 72,000 people made Hajj. It's lucky they didn't, they didn't have to go to the Saudi embassy. 72,000 people. You don't need a visa then. Your visa is Shahada. So they made, they crossed the desert. They had so much gold with them that they changed the economy of every country they reached. Just imagine how much gold he has, right? 
He's got gold the side of grapefruits. So when he reached Cairo, the leaders of Cairo were a group called Mamluks, the Bahri Mamluks. And they were originally from uh, the Turkish Stan area. They were taken as mercenary slaves. And they took over Egypt. And they became great leaders of Islam. Sayyid Adin Qutuz was the leader who stopped the Mongols. These are the Mamluks, right? So the Bahri Mamluks who lived on the shore of the Nile, that's what they called the Baha, like the sea. The Bahri Mamluks, they fell in love with Mansa Musa and they gave him a Mamluk cavalry escort to Egypt, uh, to Mecca. When he came back, uh, Emir Hajib sat with him. And he said to him, and this is, and I quote this in my book here, you can find the reference. He asked him, where did you get this power from? So Munsa Musa told him, we are in the lineage of the Malian kings. Allah blessed us with gold, and this is our authority. And in this writing, Mansa Musa states, my predecessor, Mansa Abu Bakr. Mansa means Amir, right, or king. Mansa Abu Bakr went into the, he sent 200 ships into the ocean. That's what it says in, in the book. One ship came back. And he said that when they were out in the ocean, they said it was a river in the ocean. And it was pulling all the boats away. So this one managed to turn around and evade this river. That's the currents, right? He evaded the river, the current. He came back to Mali. And he told Mansa Abu Bakr, who was you know, uh, immensely rich. Mansa Abu Bakr fit out 2,000 ships. 1,000 for his men and 1,000 for supplies. And they went into the ocean. They never came back. Never. Okay? What happened to them? What happened to Mansa Abu Bakr? See? And, and these are the great uh, leaders of Mali. And, and just to give you an idea uh, of the leaders of Mali, you know, just to bring this home to you, because, again, it's something hard to really um, grasp. Who are these people? What's their connection you know, with Islam? This is a map that shows you uh, North Africa and right down into Mali. At the bottom, uh, where the arrows are right on the bottom, where it turns into the yellow color, this is where um, the Niger River is. And right below the Niger River was the gold. These are some of the trade routes that take you across the desert. Okay, from Tripoli, there you go go to Gadamas and down into Bilma, and it's a Kanem. From Qairawan, which was the western capital of Islam in Tunisia, you go down to Tahrit, and then Tadmecca, and to a place called Gao. From Fez, you go down to Sijil Masa, and then to Audagast, into a place called Ghana. So this was major routes that you go right. It's like your 401 and, you know, whatever. So these are your major highways taking you across the desert. Okay? And it was the, um, the Sanhaja Berba, Amazigh, of the Sanhaja group. They are the ones who take you across the desert. Okay? And so this is a group now, right? That's how people look today. This is a present-day picture that I took in Mali, in Timbuktu. These are people called Tawarek. And the Tawarek are the ones that wear the, the men wear the veils on their face. Right? And um, they wear blue in the desert. Um, that's a Tuareg family up until today. They like to go in the desert. They don't want to sleep with a roof over their head. They're Bedouins. Right? So they, every day they go out. So these, these are the people who led you across the ocean. Here's Mansa Musa here. This is a map that was drawn by a European map maker. See Mansa Musa holding up the gold? He probably didn't look like that with a crown like that. But look at the gold he has in his hand. That's the image of Mansa Musa. What they consider to be the richest man in history. Okay, when he reached Egypt, right, here's the Bahri Mamluks taking him into Hajj. Okay, now when Mansa Musa was coming back, okay, he's coming back from pilgrimage. He gave some of his gold, or he spent his gold on contracts. He contracted architects, artisans, scholars to come back with him to West Africa. 
Every place he stopped, he built a masjid. When he reached the city of Timbuktu, see Timbuktu in the red? Now, Timbuktu was a joke to us before. If you say, oh, go to Timbuktu, that means go to the moon, go get lost. Timbuktu was a center of learning. It was first a trading center, and then it became a center of scholarship. By the 16th century, Timbuktu had 150 schools, had a university called Sankore, with over 25,000 students. 16th century, 25,000 students studying math, science, astronomy. They were experts in fiqh, Maliki fiqh. Okay, the city of Timbuktu. Up until today, they have thousands of books in this region there. It's about, 100, about 500 kilometers from the Mauritanian border. Okay, so it's right in the desert in the Sahara. So this is al Umari's report now. Okay, and that's his book. And Mansa Abu Bakr, he ventures into the ocean with 2,000 ships. Okay, this is where we left off. Now, inscriptions. How do we know? The Spanish burnt all the books. But they didn't know about the inscriptions that they were writing on walls and in different places. So that's one of the ways that we can trace. Uh, what happened to these, these, these 2,000 ships? 1,000 ships just for his men and 1,000 for supplies. Where did they go? Okay, now they have found, historians found the, the writings of the Mandinka people, Mande language. They found inscriptions along the Amazon River, Brazil, into Peru, up into Central America, Panama, into the United States. And a Harvard University scholar called Leo Weiner, who wrote a book called Africa and the Discovery of America. He actually talked about these Mandinka. Africa and the Discovery of America. Leo Weiner, W-E-I-N-E-R. Leo Weiner, He's a Harvard University scholar. He talked about the presence of the Muslims uh, in these lands. Okay? Now, this is what their pictographs, inscriptions actually look like. Okay? This one here is translated to mean, they found it in Peru. It says, man to pursue worship, to mature, to become matter without life. Man pursues a, a cavernous a cavernous place. In other words, you're going to die. So they're talking about different phases of life. Okay, this is what they found in Peru. They found them also in Mexico. They found them in Arizona, uh, in the United States. They say that the Mandinka actually went up the Mississippi. And that's what Leo Weiner was talking about. And he was showing in the culture of the Native Americans that there was a lot of traces of um, these people. But in, in Central America is where you find them the most. Okay? Alexander von Withenu, who was a European professor of art history uh, in Mexico City, he um, made this special uh, presentation, uh, and that was in 1965, from 1939 to 1965. He put up a presentation there in Mexico City, and he brought uh, what they call terracotta figures, masks, potteries, this is one of the masks. Look at this picture. That is not a Mexican face. Okay, this is before Columbus. It dates back to before Columbus. Look at this face here. And if you look closely at it, you'll see scarification. That is something, you know, used in West Africa. It's like a passport. But look what he has on. He's got a turban and a cap. See it? That's in Mexico they found this. Mexicans did not dress like this. Okay? And one of their conquistador, so-called discoverers named Balboa, they said he discovered the Pacific Ocean. How can you discover the Pacific Ocean? People lived on it for thousands of years. That's another one. But when Balboa reached the uh, Cuareca province in Panama, the Hispanic people living there, you'd call the native Indians, they said that on that side, by the Caribbean side, there's dark-skinned people with beards. He, they said, don't go there. You better go the other way, because they're fierce. Okay, so these African people with beards are found 
all over the region. They're found on the coastlines. They're found on some of the islands. Ferdinand Columbus, when he went to northern Honduras, his father never made it, but Ferdinand went in. He found women, and he writes in his thing, he said that the gold in their ear was so heavy that you could put it, uh, it left like the skin stretch and you could put an egg through it. Now, this is a picture of a Fulani woman from West Africa. Okay, see her earrings? That's some serious gold there, right? Her dowry is a big one, right? That sister there. Because remember, Mansa Musa, they had so much gold, that was their culture, right? So it was so heavy, it would even stretch. Now this is fashion now. People putting pins and things and all over. But now, that is similar to what was described by Ferdinand Columbus. That's a Fulani woman today. Look at the face here in your picture. That's an African face. That's not a Mexican face. That was also found in Mexico. It was on display in Mexico City. Okay, so these Mandinka people traveled um, up Central America in Panamanian history. That's part of their culture. They recognize African people. All along the Caribbean coast, you'll find people of African descent. Now, there were many that moved in later because the Panama Canal. So you'll have many people who were from Barbados or from Jamaica. But there are also people amongst the natives there um, that uh, they speak an African language and they're different. This is one of the interesting Mandinka inscriptions found in Arizona. Look at it. They, they even said in Arizona, they said, the elephants are sick and angry. Right? So they said, at present, the sick elephants are considerable. That's what they said in America. So it is amazing the things that you actually find. Okay? Now, what else did Columbus find? What's another proof? The natives on the islands, they called gold guanine. They called it guanine. And when Columbus, in his memoirs, when he checked out the gold, he found that it was 32 parts, 18 gold, 6 uh, silver, 8 copper. And this is the alloy that is used in West Africa. Because remember, the West Africans were the ones sending the gold. You don't just give straight gold. They mix it with other things. They make an alloy. Okay? And that was the exact uh, composition of the West African gold. They found that same thing in the Caribbean region. Okay? So... Amongst, uh, in, in the Mandingo language, for gold, they say Rana or Rani, uh, coming out of Arabic, they say Kane, sees Kanin or Ranin. So Ranin, that one there, the natives called it Guanin. It's the same name. Okay? That's another proof. Also, tribal names, family names. In Honduras, there are African people, they call themselves Almamis. And Almamis is the West African word for Imam. It comes from Imam, uh, El Imam, Imamu, Almamis. That's how they pronounce it. It's a West African uh, word. There's also family names like Jadas, Guaba, Kaba. You find this all over Central America. So that's another proof. Their presence is there if you have the eyes to see. Also, Ferdinand Columbus and Cortez, who was the conqueror of, of Mexico, they found women with clo cloth similar to Granada in Al Andalus. They call Moorish. Um, they found a number of things. But one of the real distinct uh, uh, proofs, which is alive, are a group of people called Garifuna. The Garifuna people they live in Belize, Central America, British Honduras. They live along the coastline. They live on some of the islands like St. Vincent and Dominica. And when the Spanish came in the region and they found them, they called them black caribs. Remember the word carib? In Arawak, they say these ones are black caribs. And this is an actual picture of the Garifuna people in Belize. That, I don't know what they're doing in this picture, but this is an actual picture of them. The British are smart, though. They want to explain everything, right? 
So the British said they're black Caribs and they were escaped slaves. But how could they be escaped slaves if the Spanish saw them when they first came? That doesn't make sense. They were already there. You see? But it makes sense when you have Mansa Abu Bakr with 2,000 ships and with his men coming in the area. And these people there, they ceremonially did not eat pork. They also used uh, different crescent. They even had a crescent uh, symbol. There's, there's, there's all types of things about these people. Morality, strong morality, their families, uh, a lot of traces. But for the most part, today, they lost uh, their Islam. They're in the region, if you look at Central America, all on the Caribbean coast, and in Colombia, in South America, you'll find them there as well. And alhamdulillah, many of the Garifuna now are returning to Islam. And so they are one of the groups accepting Islam in Central America. And uh, it is a presence of Muslims. And they're speaking a dialect, an African dialect, mixed with Spanish. So it's still there. So Muslims actually populated this region and they're actually part of the societies of the peoples of the Americas before Columbus actually came. So this is another proof to show us that we are not uh, late comers, just off the boat. We were actually here before Columbus was here. So that's your next wave. That, that's the wave, the first wave we're talking about before Columbus. Right? These are some of the proofs. And for more details, there's a lot more details. You get it uh, in the book. Uh, you can follow up the details. So I want to open up the floor for any questions that you may have uh, concerning this first wave that we're looking at. This is before Columbus wave. They just, you know, they use the word men, which means people. Um, Allah knows best. There's no details about who he put on the boat. But he must have, they must have had women on the boat. That wouldn't make sense. The only time when you see people bringing in only men is in slavery situations. But if you're doing a migration, um, probably not. But it's possible that they, you know, they obviously in intermarried with the local people there when they reached. Yeah, question. Okay, this is a science fiction question, which is saying, you know, could they have been lost in the Bermuda Triangle? Okay, number one, the Bermuda Triangle is too far north. Because if you look at the ocean, Bermuda is off the coast of the United States, high. So where they went, if you look at the map where they went, Senegal, right, and, and you know, Gambia, they're that coast, they go right into Brazil. That's the shortest distance. Bermuda is way up. So the current would not take you up to Bermuda. Question. Yeah. Yeah. Because you see, one of the problems that we're facing is that these areas were conquered by the Spanish. And what the Spanish did, because you remember that Al Andalus, the, Muslims lived for 781 years in El Andalus. And the Spanish fought bitter war against the Muslims. Bitter fighting. Especially at the end in Granada. And these people became what they call conquistadors. Special forces. And what they used to do with the Muslims, they were so afraid of Islamic literature that they would take all the books and put it in the middle of the town in Granada, Toledo, uh, Valencia. They would put it in the middle of the town, burn it. So every place they went, if they find anything written, and they know Arabic too, they know Arabic, they know what it is. On stones, like I say, this is the proofs that we have. There are different proofs that come. 
But in terms of the writings, they would destroy every possible thing that they could. And this is what the problem is in terms of trying to piece together early American history because of, of what the Spanish did call scorch earth policy. In Egypt, uh, when Napoleon came to Egypt and he saw the Finks, and the Finks had a, um, an African face on it. Right. He instructed his uh, artillery people to blow the face off the Finks. So every time we see the Finks, we don't see it with a nose. So what I'm saying to you is that people who are colonializers, they will destroy everything that reminds you of another civilization. Because part of what they try to do is say that you're not existing. You understand what I'm saying? So yeah, so any, any physical object would be destroyed because it has no, no value and no purpose except to prove something else, which is not what you want to prove, right? I mean, even in Spain itself, in Portugal, where Muslims lived for hundreds of years and had thousands of books, in some parts, you, you only trace you find sometime in a building you might see something that was still there, and now they're bringing things up. But it was a scorch earth policy of the, of the Spanish. Complete, and anything to do with Islam, finished. That was the policy. Actually, there is in, in, in Cuba, there, there's some people, they found like uh, a mosque and stuff, and it's, it's written on them like in, by the Arabic uh, yeah. calligraphy. And, and they say that when um, Columbus came into the bay in Cuba, he looked up on the hill and he said, this mesquita, he said it's a mosque on the top of the hill. That's in his memoirs. You know, so there are some traces in, uh, I'm going to show you later on, there's some trace in, um, in Colombia. There's some trace in a church. Um, in a few places you find some traces of things. I mean, you see it in their culture, but the Spanish inherited, they took our culture. So the hacienda, their buildings and everything is all Islamic buildings from Al Andalus. Like most of Spanish culture, 60% of it is from Muslims. You know, so, and, and they transferred that over here to the Americas you know, when they set up the colonies here. What is our uh, long-term goal? Like, what we're trying to do connect our history to You mean in terms, in general? Yes. Yeah, I mean, li like I say, part of this, th 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 this course here, you know, is it gives us an identity. In other words, who are you as a Muslim? Somebody here in Canada might say, you Muslims, why don't you go home? Man? You're making too much trouble. You people just blow things up. Like, well, you're not part of our society. We're Canadians. So if you don't know your history and know yourself, right, then you start thinking bad, like, maybe I should go home. But the first thing you've got to understand is the word Canada itself is an Iroquois word, Canada, which means a big village. So it's not even a European word. So the Europeans are immigrants here. The real Canadians are the natives. So we have just as much rights to Canada as anybody else. And this is important right now, you know. Very important that we understand our identity. And part of this study, inshallah, we're going to study the history of Islam in Canada. That's going to be one of our classes. What happened here? Right? But we're building for the first waves so you can start to see how many waves of Muslims were actually in this part of the world. That's what they're doing now with history. They, they take people's memory away. And they show you movies where they rewrite history. And they show the Europeans, King Richard, you know, uh, King Arthur and all in beautiful clothes. And that's not what they were wearing, man. It was the people in Andalus that had those clothes and those beautiful palaces. And they rewrite history and what most of the youth are now watching, their heroes are like mutant creatures and X-Men and aliens and things like this. Instead of real reality of who we actually are. And when they show a Muslim, what is the Muslim usually doing in a movie? It's a terrorist. Right? Killing someone. Destroying, right? That's propaganda. That's not what we did. We actually built this place. We actually intermingled with the native people. So we have to, our consciousness has to change, not think negative about ourselves. You see, in history, really, if you study it properly, it will give you that confidence and that knowledge to be able to handle these questions that are going to come at us. That's why we study this. 
right? Not just to feel good. But, you know, it, it'll change your understanding of yourself. So we not be ashamed of ourselves, right? Muslim now, he, he's ashamed. He's, he's Bilal in the mosque, mashallah. When he goes out, he's Billy. He doesn't change his name and his identity because he's ashamed of himself, right? So, so we, we have to learn not to be ashamed of ourselves, you know, and to, um, you know, uh, know what the history is. Any questions, sisters, on your side? The floor is open for any questions. Yeah. That's right. Now you see it in, especially Mexico, you'll see in Mexico and um, big pyramids. And it goes down into Guatemala and Honduras and that region. These were the Mayan people and the Aztecs. So they built big, and then in Peru there's um, the Incas. You know, so these are big, uh, this is the presence of the early people. Okay? Muslims, you will see, you know, different kinds of contributions. We were not necessarily the, the pyramid builders. But that's part of the, some people are proving that they were Africans, Nubians, and they're saying that the, the, the ship, uh, the sailors were what they call um, uh, 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 Phoenicians. They're from Lebanon. They're Phoenicians, Carthaginians. They were the sailors. And the Nubians, they, they work for the Nubians. And you'll see the Nubian pyramids in Sudan and places like that now. That's very similar to the ones that's in Mexico as well. Okay. Because this is important, because what some, peop what some historians tried to do, they said, we'll solve the problem. It was aliens that came down on Earth and built the pyramids in Egypt, and they, they flew over to Mexico, and they built the pyramids. They actually say this, right? There's stories about this. It's in some history books. And they have a thing now where they say, um, you know, that, that the pyramids of Egypt, you know, was actually made by aliens. Because how could Africa make this? An Egyptian. That's not possible. All you can make is, uh, you know, fool mudemmes or, you know, ta'miya, falafels. It's not possible, man. You had a question back there? Yes, brother. Yeah, it's uh, more a comment on the uh, old maps that yeah. you have shown. Yeah. Idrisi map and so on. Mm -hmm. Actually, the, they are not mixing uh, north and, uh, and south. But um, uh, for Arabs, the, the, the north is, uh, is down and the south is up. That's right. And it seems that uh, I have read um, an article that yeah. this is also the vision of uh, the Holy Quran on, uh, on the way how it sees the, the world. That's right. Based on the many uh, sura uh, verses from Kaf, a journey of Musa. Mm -hmm to meet Al-Khedr, uh, journey of uh, dhul Qarnayn, and it seems that this is the vision actually of the Quran on, uh, on the world. Yeah. Uh, s uh, north is down and south is up. That's right, and this is a perspective. You can even get a map now, which is called an upside down map, where you can actually get a map like that. Because it's a different perspective. That perspective was, you know, that was our perspective. That's why I say our perspective is very important. We're following Eurocentrism, right? We're following Europe, Greenwich Mean Time. Up is developed, below is underdeveloped. Up is civilized, south is uncivilized. No, south was civilized first, and then the north. So you have to change our perspective in order to be able to understand some of these things. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense, right? So perspective is a very important uh, issue. Yes, brother. Sheikh, uh, can you give us a light on the word mosque? How did it came? Because I heard that mosque came from mosquito. Yeah, I mean, this is a story about the Spanish word mesquita, you know, but, that, but that, that's not really a true uh, story. I, I've never found any authentic proof about that. You know. But I mean, we say masjid as well, you know, and, uh, but when they say, if you're in Cordoba, I, I go to Cordoba every year, and you're in Cordoba, and the people of Cordoba actually say la mesquita, they call the, the masjid, it's a cathedral now, but they still call it the masjid, with respect. Not trying to put it down, right? They say it with respect. They don't even call it a cathedral. They call it a, you know, mesquita. But it's, it's, it wasn't f from that, uh, that, that isn't a true report. Yeah, but some people thought it was, yeah. I don't know where, how they got mosque. It's all pronunciations of words. Yeah. 
Any other questions uh, anybody has over this side? Brothers have any more questions? So next week, inshallah, not to hold anybody, we want to be precise on our time. Next week, inshallah, we're going to look at the wave that came with Columbus. And just after Columbus's time, this is a really interesting part. This is some knowledge that's really new. Do you know that the first country to recognize the United States was Morocco, the Sultan of Morocco, was the first international leader to recognize the United States. Okay, so this is some interesting information that will come next week. So we'll see then. We'll see you then, inshallah. Have a safe journey home. With bilahi tawfiq. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.